There are reports the Australian government trained and employed a team of Chinese scientists now the subject of a probe into the origins of the about viruses. I'm back in Australia today. Well, I never left <laughs> since the last podcast. I'm in Geelong, which is a town south of Melbourne, and my special guest today is Lin Fa Wang. Hi, Vincent. Welcome to TWIV. Yeah, welcome you to Geelong. Thank you. Yeah. In other countries, SARS are BSS3, but Australia, we did not have a single human case. So when we apply for importation from the government, they put a condition to say we had to work under BSS4 for Four. SARS. Okay. You know, so yeah, but in other countries, SARS will be BSS3. Yeah. And in the BSL4, what kind of viruses would you work on there? Uh, we have almost the whole collection of the recent emergent viruses, right? So, you know, we start with Hendra, Virus, and then we had a Nipper Malaysia, and then a Nipper Bangladesh, of course, and then we have Ebola, Marble virus, and then then we had a SARS virus, and more recently the MERS virus, both from humor and the camel. Okay. Yeah. And any future pathogen that's human considered a BSL4, you'll be able to work on it in there as well. I mean, we can work on any pathogens. Just, just you know, our expertise in this sort of area, okay. and especially yeah. with bat-borne sort of. Uh, uh, BSL-4 pathogens because our uh, history to start with Hennepin virus and went into coronal SARS and MERS virus. Yeah. That's, and, yes, I'm a co-author of that paper. Yeah. So the, the Dr. Zheng Li Shi from Wuhan Institute of Virology was my real collaborator and we have been collaborating for ten, more than 10 years because uh, when we first detect this, you know, I mean, and after that, of course, there's so many coronavirus have been detected, sequences have been detected in bats all around the world but not a single isolation. That really puzzled us, you know, everybody tried. And then, so uh, Gary Cramery from my lab went to Wuhan and he is a, a very experienced virologist. And, uh, and so we optimized the, the isolation so procedure. about getting infectious virus. That's right. right. So we, I told Zheng Li, you know, that I said, you know, anybody can do PCR. Yeah. Of course, you know, you know, if the more you do, the more closer relative virus you can find. But I said, as a virologist, eventually you had to prove and also to isolate a real virus. So I want you know? to hear that again. So yeah. if you just do PCR, it doesn't yeah. prove that the vir infectious virus is there, right? Well, I think it's not as strong, right? Because yeah. you're in a BSF-4 environment because they're in sativus beds. We have done two challenge experiments for SARS and I think my technician will never do that again because uh, these guys, you know, to keep them alive in BSF-4 is a challenge. It's really lab-based and bio component is our strength. Yeah, yeah. But I have collaboration all over the world, you know, so when people say, can you help with the samples? And then so we... They're more than happy to oblige. That was Dr. Wang, ladies and gentlemen, the most premier expert in coronaviruses and was one of the original scientists to isolate the SARS-1 strain in the wild, ladies and gentlemen. A lot of information to cover. We're not going to be able to cover everything. We're going to try and get through as much as we can in this broadcast in the origins of the coronavirus and the smoking gun. What brought us to Dr. Lin Fa Wang, uh, in the first place, it was really this smoking gun paper back from 2007 that essentially uh, is the first documented paper talking about SARS chimera strains with HIV for vaccines and the like. But basically, we're looking at gain of function research so that they could take some kind of virus from you know, the jungle and make it infect humans because otherwise it wouldn't have infected humans. They made it infect humans. And that's what this re that's why people are focusing on this research. And, you know, millions of people have been paging through all of these research papers with very familiar names. Now you heard Dr. Wang, Linfa Wang talk about uh, Zheng Li Shi and we'll be, we'll be getting into that and many others, but this is all coming out of the Wuhan Institute of Virology and Geelong, Australia, uh, where you just heard the interview. Now, there's a reason why all of this, you know, happened in Wuhan. There's a reason why Wuhan was the ground zero for this epidemic. It wasn't by chance, ladies and gentlemen. This is one of the few locations in the world that was working with Chimera, SARS, 
viruses. And that's essentially what we got with this kind with this SARS 2.0 or perhaps 3.0 as far as we know. And in any case, there's a reason why this erupted in Wuhan. It didn't erupt in some village near the jungle. It didn't erupt, you know, in the usual places. This was like downtown Wuhan, just blocks away from a weapons lab. And we've got all the familiar names, you know, associated here with this outbreak. And that's what really makes it interesting. Now, all of this is back in the news, especially the lab and the like, because essentially the National Institute of Health has leveled some serious charges against the Wuhan Institute of Virology. And, you know, there's, they're looking for scientists, they're looking to go to the lab, they're looking to investigate, they want the original sample that they sequence so that they can see what was like the earliest form of this virus before mutations, etc. It looks like serious questions, but perhaps, you know, they are pointed in the right direction and perhaps the questions are not pointed in the right direction. We're going to get into why we say that, hopefully. But Australia is looking into, you know, the scientists that they funded and employed at, you know, as being the source of this chimera strain that we call SARS 2.0. And we know it went through the, the Geelong lab. We know it went through the Wuhan lab. And somehow it ended up, you know, in the wet market. And that's what everybody wants to know. How do you connect the dots to the wet market? And we're going to try and uh, get into that. We're going to speed through some updates and then try and wrap up uh, with some of the news. But director of the Chinese CDC said he had gone to Wuhan to collect samples of COVID. Wuhan uh, seafood market, a victim uh, of this outbreak. Now, the Wuhan CDC, like the American CDC, um, is, you know, basically a bioweapons lab, if you will. And this is actually three blocks away from the seafood market. Now, we, I think we've got a map of this, essentially. Um, perhaps this will help illustrate. But uh, the seafood market is here, and the CDC is right here. It's like literally, um, you know, three football fields away, three blocks away. And the Wuhan Institute of Virology is way on the other side of town. So it looks like this was the local delivery service. And they probably couldn't have done it without the support of everybody else, including, you know, the Wuhan Institute of Virology. But it really went through, you know, the center of disease control. It had to have uh, before, uh, you know, hitting the market. And we also know that the Union Hospital uh, right next door to the CDC is where the first group of doctors were infected. So we know that the Wuhan CDC was basically, you know, the point of service in this operation. And the question is, you know, did they walk it out of the lab? Uh, did some technician, you know, have an accident? Um, did somebody, you know, spike the coffee? right who did it why that's the big question and i think that's what they're trying to get at right now uh ladies and gentlemen and um you know like we said the national institute of health has been talking about um you know the wuhan institute of virology in the news and there's you know it's it's dragging in new names that people should be aware of like peter dasik and this guy starred in a movie with bill gates about the next pandemic, you couldn't really make that stuff up and we're gonna have to produce like a full feature film on all of this content but there's really so much to talk about that you could never just you know put it all in a movie um, SARS COVID-2 uh, was passaged two times uh, etc cetera, etc cetera. no evolution in the consensus sequence was identified suggesting previous adaptation to cell culture for both strains these things were engineered everybody's saying that you know the SARS that's out there right now infecting people was engineered and here's some of the questions that the NIH NASA, National Institute of Health is asking uh, Peter Daszak's uh, group which is actually uh, the recipient of the grant from the NIAID overseeing the research of gain-of-function 
uh, viruses at the Wuhan lab. So it's, you know, there's a lot of proxies. It's the Umbrella Corporation. But this guy is a major player in the supply chain, in the pipeline for this virus. And so here are the questions. Number one, provide uh, an original sample uh, of the SARS-CoV virus that the Wuhan Institute of Virology used to determine the viral sequence. Explain the disappearance of patient zero, Huang Yanling, a scientist technician who worked at the Wuhan Institute of Virology lab, uh, but whose lab uh, presence has been deleted. Provide uh, the NIH with the Wuhan Institute of Virology's responses to the State uh, Department cables in 2018, citing safety concerns. Uh, question four, disclose and explain out of ordinary restrictions on laboratory facilities. It looked like everything was locked down and barricaded in the month of October. And we're gonna get into a special dossier that uh, is out there um, you know, from intelligence circles and it's been circulated in the mainstream media highlighting how you know, basically the um, the cell phones disappeared and explain why the Wuhan Institute of Virology failed to note that the RATG13 virus, the bat-derived coronavirus, uh, in its collection with the greatest similarity to SARS-CoV-2. So the closest relative that they can find out there to the current strains come from the Wuhan lab. They didn't come from, you know, the wild. Now, essentially, perhaps they did at one point in time, but then they were modified. And this is the last only uh, recorded closest uh, relative to the current strain. So it really puts, you know, the Wuhan Institute of Virology right in the middle of it. But, you know, they're trying to make it seem like, you know, it was some kind of leak. And I think we have um, a report on that somewhere. Don't tell us where, don't ask us where it is, uh, but we'll find it eventually. Maybe it's over here. So this was kind of like the report detailing the evacuation of uh, the Wuhan Institute of Virology, the blockades, the roadblocks. And as you can see, I mean, the facility is kind of isolated uh, in a sense compared to, you know, the rest of the city. And even if it were to, you know, get released, I think we might have, you know, some more pictures, even if the, if it were to like blow out the window per se, chances are, you know, it wouldn't infect anybody. And so, you know, if you're going to kick off an epidemic like this, you need somebody out there spraying virus or else shedding virus in, you know, uh, in the city. And, you know, the best way is probably to just spike somebody's drink. So maybe they spike somebody's drink at the uh, CDC. I came to visit uh, the Wuhan Institute of Virology, you know, in perfect, you know, plausible deniability. Uh, the super spreader doesn't know they've been infected and there's no, you know, tracing it back to the new world order. And that's how I would do it. But, you know, there might be other scenarios too that, that work out really well. Uh, I don't really buy into, you know, it blowing out the vents and I don't really buy into it, you know, uh, getting leaked into the wastewater. I think it's more than likely, you know, um, a direct inoculation somehow uh, or injection or something of that nature. And of course, you, you can't forget about, you know, the back end of this deal where all the countries let this virus in. And that's what really kind of expands or broadens the, the motives and the possibilities here. You know, all of the governments and health departments were giving people the wrong advice as far as how to... Um, you know, deal with this virus. And, you know, all of these specialists knew that coronavirus is a respiratory illness. It looked like it, you know, escaped the lab day one, and yet they were just like, wash your hands, go to the rallies, no big deal. So they wanted people to get infected. And that's part of the plan. And so, you know, regardless of it, you know, coming out of the Wuhan Institute of Virology, regardless of uh, you know, all of the research papers and the researchers, you know, that we've uh, discovered, the names that we've discovered, at the end of the day, I mean, they let this virus in. Now, this is probably the most bombshell um, white paper, I think, to date. One of them, for sure. And 
basically, um, if we can find it again, I thought this was in a different format, but certainly looks like uh, the main one here. And if we can uh, just scan through this, because honestly, I was expecting it in the web format. I'm not sure what happened to the web format. This is the web format, I think. No, but this is probably what we were looking for. So a SARS-like cluster of circulating back coronaviruses shows potential for human emergence. So it's a very subtle title. You know, it has the potential to emerge naturally. So you, you know, you think about that. And essentially what they've done is that they made a group of viruses encoded with a special spike protein um, of that works with human ACE2 replicates efficiently in primary human airway cells and achieves uh, titers equivalent to epidemic strains of car, uh, SARS CoV 2. So, essentially, here, ladies and gentlemen, what we're seeing is them, you know, engineering viruses from, uh, from the wild, wild type viruses and making them so that they're like, you know, super infectious human viruses. And so what we have here is, you know, basically the same names, the same people, all attached back to, you know, Bill Gates and Fauci and all of that. And, you know, they let this virus in, they're trying to sell you the vaccines and the like. Um, what do we got here? Long haulers, they say. People that have been affected for you know, many months now. Uh, are demanding better care and obviously there is no care for anybody right now it's just you know sit at home and die and so we know that the hydroxychloroquine has uh, quite a bit of promise in terms of you know clearing the virus but there's no guarantee that that will end the systemic infection there's a lot they're not saying about this virus we know that in a lot of similar types of coronaviruses you know, people. A lot of people will die uh, a year and a half down the road due to encephalitis, and I think that's going to really be like the backhaul of this. That's why it's important to really kind of do everything you can to prevent uh, CNS infection, um, and it's just going to travel from like organ to organ, tissue to tissue, starts in the lungs and just kind of works its way through like Ebola. We've listed, you know, quite a few things in the video description that we feel will help that you can find at a, you know, at a organic nutrition store, you know, detox, anti-inflammatory detox herbs that, you know, hopefully you can find in some kind of elixir, uh, as well as, you know, taking your vitamins, magnesium will help you get your energy back. I think that's what a lot of these people are feeling. So, you know, if you're, you know, feeling the fatigue like mono, nucleosis uh then you know take some magnesium but it it persists uh let's see what else is this uh peter dasik which is really turning out to be a, a pretty hardcore shill here um and certainly a key player and you know in deploying uh the the pandemic um statement on the latest uh, development regarding the uh, research funding uh, let's see I think there was something interesting here but we'll get back into that one maybe one day uh, top US body asks explosive questions on the origin of the cor coronavirus so you know this made the news a couple days ago but you probably didn't get a whole lot of um, you know updates about it here was a really interesting um article from nature again i think it was one of the uh, familiar names here but they're talking about um schematic of the rewired sars covid mutants 2018 so they've got all sorts of mutants they've got all sorts of sars type viruses that do all sorts of different things and that's the danger here they're sitting on all sorts of strains, uh, ladies and gentlemen. And so, again, this was like, you know, the first bombshell um, white paper that really started raising red flags. You know, we've got SARS chimera strains floating around 2007, 
uh, you know, with HIV and all of this stuff. And it's like, you know, who would do that? But again, you know, this is all under the guise of uh, vaccine research. But it's really, you know, the cover story for, you know, bioweapons programs these days. And, you know, there's so much you could say about how these, you know, programs should be shut down. And, you know, they're obviously causing more harm than good. This is some kind of like, you know, bio Chernobyl Fukushima that's melted down and infected everybody. And it should have been treated, you know, more seriously at first, which is all the more reason to be suspicious. Um, and of course, you know, we talked about, you know, this big bombshell paper and, you know, we're seeing the same labs, uh, Chapel Hill, North Carolina, um, you know, there's a lot of names you could name, a lot of people that are perhaps, you know, unwitting participants, but you got a lot of people with like, you know, questionable characters that are looking to basically, you know, go rogue and circumvent uh, the gain of function research restrictions uh, for their own, you know, personal gain or for the sake of science, if you will. And obviously, you know, it's really blown up in everybody's faces. And I think it's really ironic, you know, when you come back to uh, the Linfo Wang story, and I'm sure, you know, all of the collaborators here, um, you know, they were the pioneers that discovered the first strain that really put it all together. I mean, these people are super brains and the like. And it's really like their work that pioneered and made uh, SARS 2.0 po possible. You know, it's kind of ironic that their discoveries uh, actually led to this second wave or this, you know, second version of SARS. And you could, you know, talk about a lot of the outbreaks that have happened recently, like the Ebola outbreak. As soon as they uh, discovered what happened in West Africa with the Ebola outbreak, they, they started implementing, you know, gain of function research restrictions, ending it essentially in America. And that's when things really started shifting towards Wuhan and you know it's hard to say when they found their strain and it's hard to say whose strain it actually is but we know that a lot of the strains uh, were coming out of the North Carolina labs and they really perfected uh, a routine to you know passage viruses find the most virulent uh, the ones that kill the fastest they were looking at cross protection they were looking at a lot of the variables necessary to make this pandemic possible, not only the initial release of the Wuhan strain, but also the, um, you know, kind of like the controlled burns, if you will, in this wildfire outbreak that prevented, you know, the Wuhan strain from going to every other place. And we've talked about that, uh, you know, the numerous other strains of this virus, you know, you know, massive deletions in the code that, you know, make this virus much worse, especially you know, contributing to the cytokine storms. And so they really had all of this planned out, mapped out, you know, way in advance, total, you know, they had all of their research done. And uh, again, we're seeing the same names. And the question is, you know, was their work hijacked by, you know, Bill Gates, Fauci, or, you know, somebody else and uh, used for nefarious purposes? Was it an accident? Uh, but it's definitely lab related. And again, given that, you know, they've let this in, uh, it's almost undoubted, uh, it's almost, you know, beyond question that this is a pandemic. you know, to sell vaccines and therapies and, you know, to enforce restrictions and the like. And I think that, you know, they're going to have people chasing their tails um, or, you know, different rabbit holes with all of these different scientists. Uh, you know, they're looking for this one. They're looking for that one. What did they do? But you really have to look at uh, the point of service or the point of delivery, if you will. And essentially, you know, this brings us back to the Wuhan lab um, or the Wuhan seafood market and the hospitals and the doctors right next door. And it's like, how did it get there? How did it go from the lab and to... Um, you know, these people out in the city. And we think that, you know, obviously in the chain of events, the Wuhan uh, CDC makes a lot of sense because it was right next door. So it must have gone from the, you know, Institute of Virology 
uh, to the CDC, to the seafood market? And how did it get to that last mile? You know, you know, delivery companies often talk about that last mile. How did it get to that last mile? And I think that's really going to answer a lot of questions. And, um, you know, it would seem like, um, you know, again, that this was introduced on purpose and it wasn't some kind of accident. And, uh, you know, they also have like a really, you know, mega bio security surveillance system out there in China after SARS. And that thing completely failed. You had all sorts of doctors disappear. You had, you know, whistleblowers disappear. You had, um, you know, patient zero disappear. So you have to wonder, you know, uh, why did that happen? Why did all those, you know, fail safes or circuit breakers fail, you know, and so there's a lot of questions to be asked. Again, we think they probably spiked somebody's drink. Um, but, you know, they're going to keep pushing for the accident. It was an accident. It was an accident. It just, you know, jumped out of the lab. And, you know, you're seeing, you know, all of this predictive programming, foreshadowing and the like. And, it you know, it just seems really um, tough to, uh, you know, fathom, if you will that this was some kind of accident with all of the predictive programming and all of the you know motives and the gains here um we've got you know all sorts of papers talking about um you know chimera strains that you know originally didn't infect humans but now they do and we even see that some of these strains were kept off the books we see that in this author correction, um, essentially they say that uh, the, the strain mentioned in this uh, article from 2015 hadn't been deposited in gene bank until uh, April or so of this year. And so, you know, they waited three or four years to deposit uh, the gene uh, sequence into gene bank. Makes you wonder how many other sequences have they kept off the books. And, you know, you can kind of see the resentment, um, you know, from some of these people about the gain of function research. We know it got all shipped to Wuhan and other labs. But um, again, you know, location is everything here. We know why this erupted. You know, this um, dossier is really interesting about the cell phone traffic. It looks like something happened uh, mid-October at the Wuhan lab. But, you know what exactly is the question and even if this got flushed outside through you know the hvacs you know it's highly you know improbable that it would have infected anybody um and you know you'd have to be looking at some kind of massive thing because it looked like they shut it down for a month now it's funny because they drop you know some links here about uh you know a, a cell phone you know being linked to duke university in singapore and that would bring us right back to Lin Fa Wang. And um, you just have to wonder, you know, if, you know, if they did that on purpose or, you know, if obviously there's probably still a lot of collaboration happening between uh, Dr. Wang and, uh, and Wuhan and the like. So, you know, but it seemed like there was some kind of like training uh, going on. Um, you know safety training afterwards supposedly there's a you know they're, they're trying to frame a cover story of their, this being some kind of accidental release now from this you know laboratory but again you know we feel that chances are it transited through the wuhan cdc uh right next to the hospitals and the seafood market where all of this kind of started that would make a little more sense in terms of you know planned delivery and we feel that it was a planned delivery based on the predictive programming and you know the motives and just basically how they let this virus in and just went you know contrary to common sense and so you know we've got the names we've got you know a cover story and we've even got like a second layer to the cover story but i think that the real core to this you know tootsie roll lollipop is at the Wuhan CDC you know how many licks does it get does it take to get to the middle you know and I think we're about to find out um, I think there's you know other things that are worth talking about here uh, we know that 
just before the outbreak occurred, there was like the reports of, you know, a mysterious vaping illness. Remember like the vape lung and all that stuff? You probably forgot about it now. But essentially when you look at the CT scans from, you know, the vaping, you see pretty much the, the same things that we saw, that we see from the SARS for the most part, at least initially. Um, and then it got into something more severe with like the edemas and, and the like. This is why we say, you know, take the anti-inflammatory herbs that we have listed or the baking soda, fresh air. You know, this is the next stage. And when it starts getting here, you know, it's too late for hydroxychloroquine and the like. And so that's another angle of the story I think we'll have to cover next time. We appreciate everybody tuning in. Oh, you guys didn't see that either because of the uh, video guy. But so we'll do that again so there's the um, uh, vaping illness and then there's the ct scans from uh, vaping you can see it says vaping there and then the ct scans from uh coronavirus sars and so they're very similar except for some of the edemas here and that's why you really want to you know cut out the uh, uh inflammatories uh, and the like we'll leave it there for this broadcast till the next time ladies and gentlemen if you're listening to this you are the resistance